Again. Uh, so, super exciting to have uh, an hour of being told I'm going to try and pronounce this in Danish, Swans. But no, terrible. I'm Swedish, so his name, I'm not allowed to say his name in, in Swedish. <laughs> so, Sir is his name in Swedish, uh, who is here and is going to talk about latent space geometry. And this is really exciting because uh, uh, Professor Halberg has been running this work for, for, a very, for quite a long time. And uh, there's lots of exciting different applications that allow you to think about these GP models because they actually give us quite a bit more than we generally use them for. And I think these geometry intuitions are really cool. So, floor is all yours. Thanks, Carl. Uh, is audio working? Yes. Excellent. Thanks a bunch. Um, so, it was a heroic effort on pronouncing my name. Um, I am in this unfortunate position of having an unpronounceable name. So, uh, if you want to like, engage with me, just call me something. <laughs> I, I'm pretty flexible. Like, I will respond to most things. Um, and in, in that vein, do sort of just, if you feel like interacting, then first of all, please do. That's my favorite part of uh, lecturing. Uh, but also just shout out or throw something at me or something. If you do this, then I most likely won't notice because I'm like too caught up in my own world. So just shout at me or throw things at me or something if you feel like engaging. And I love it if you do. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about latent space geometries. Um, and before we sort of dig into what that means, I want to uh, like perhaps I'll add a little bit context here. So uh, we're at a machine learning school. And machine learning is sort of the driving engine of AI, that thing you read about in the news, right? And uh, AI is this general quest for making computers that are crazily smart. And that's cool, right? I mean, awesome. I, I like sci-fi movies and all that. But uh, what gets me excited and what I think is the driving motivation of, uh, of what I'll talk to you today it's about the idea that machine learning should help humans become smarter. So I generally don't care about machine learning. I think human learning is so much more interesting. Um, so that will sort of be the premise of what I'll uh, talk about today. It's the ambition of using machine learnings to build smarter humans. Um, let's see, now it's awake. Okay. So before we get into technicalities and whatnot, I just want to give you like an emotional preparation. Um, so this is a school that's basically about functions. Um, and in particular, like a lot of what we care about here in this forum is about distributions over functions. Gaussian processes are just distributions over functions. Um, and I'm like an old school academic, so whenever I'm being told, okay, you have to go in here and talk about distributions over functions, then my gut reaction is to say, okay, I'll talk about something else. So, uh, so what I will do, first of all, I, will, uh, like, I, I have great graphics skills, so I uh, will sort of uh, show off my, my, my skills with animations like this. Um, but I'll be, what I'll be doing is that I will completely disregard all distributional aspects of functions, meaning that I will just look at functions of the form y equals f of x, and I will treat them as deterministic objects and uh, use that to build generative models. And that's sort of uh, the exact opposite of what I'm supposed to do at this school. Um, and then we'll build these generative models, very simple models, that allow us to hopefully understand how a certain phenomenon works. Um, so we observe data that comes from some physical phenomenon. We under want to understand how it works, and we'll be using generative models for that. And when we do that, we'll sort of realize that that's not possible. That will sort of be the starting premise of, uh, of what will happen in the next hour and a half, is that we'll see that that idea is fundamentally flawed, and it's basically impossible. Um, and then, just to prepare you for the emotional uh, uh, ride, 
we'll, we'll see that, you know, okay, there, there are actually some tricks with this latent space geometry that, that makes it all possible again. And all of a sudden, it's possible to learn something from generative models. And yay, we'll all be super excited. Um, but then we'll start crying when it turns out that geometry doesn't work at all. That if you actually test it and try it out, it totally sucks and does something completely useless. So we'll, of course, uh, start collectively crying. Um, and at that point, I will sort of cave in and say, okay, I was actually given the task of, you know, relating all of this to distributions over functions. And I will sort of come crawling back to that premise. And then we'll see that the moment you start to actually worry about distributions over functions, then geometry starts to work again. So that all this stuff uh, we are here to talk about actually helps you uh, understand what happens inside all these generative models. So that's the emotional ride you're in for. Um, and now let's sort of try to make it a little bit more technical. So I say generative models. There are quite a simple class of models. They're basically uh, you're given a latent representation uh, X. That means that's something you don't get to observe. You have a prior distribution over that. And then you have a mapping that, that's a function that takes you from this latent representation to the space where your observation lives. That's a generative model. So just to make it a, a perfectly clear, here, Y are our observational data. Usually lives in some very high dimensional space. X are our unobserved latent variables. So we don't know what these are. We're trying to estimate them. Uh, and F is sort of a function that takes you from one to the representation to the other. Uh, and usually these latent representations are low dimensional. So you're trying to sort of distill the high dimensional uh, data into a low dimensional compact representation. And then the hope is that that process sort of filters out the less interesting parts of the, of the signal, of the data, and then you sort of have a low dimensional representation that we can use to better understand the actual physical phenomenon that generated the data. In terms of terminology, I'll call this mapping F, I'll call that the decoder. That's sort of in reference to the autoencoder literature. Um, many people call it the generator or what not. I call it decoder, I don't know why. Okay, and as I said, the whole ambition here is that we're getting this low dimensional compact representation and hopefully that will be revealing about the underlying phenomenon and then we humans can use that to better understand the phenomenon we're observing in order to actually become smarter about how the world works. That's sort of the uh, overarching aim here. So let's look at an example. So here I'm showing you four plots. Just look at one of them. Pick one at random. Um, and uh, this is a latent representation of a, here it's a variational autoencoder, it's not important. Um, the actual data is a collection of proteins from the beta lactamase family. Um, this is like biological data that we would like to understand how it developed, uh, where it came from. Um, and such biological data is very high dimensional. It's discrete. It's non-trivial to understand. So you can sort of imagine learning a generative model that maps you into a low dimensional representation. And then you want to use this representation to understand the biological uh, phenomenon. Now here's the core issue that we'll be dealing with today. I show, I'm showing you four panels because I did this horrible thing of trying four different random seats when fitting to my data. So I have a model. I, I know you're shaking your head. Never, ever, ever try repeating experiments. Like it's bad science. <laughs> um, repetition is not in our DNA. Um, so, Literally, like it's the exact same data, it's the exact same algorithm. The only thing I changed was the manuals, like was the random seat 
of the, the random number generator, which then changed mini batching, which changed all sorts of things. And I end up with four different representations. So sort of superficially, you look at them and say, ah, they're kind of the same. It's some colored things sticking out. Uh, but if you actually go in and analyze this in detail, I'm not a biologist, so I can't do that for you. But I can tell you that if you do that, you will reach different biological conclusions about how the world works. So there we go. We've now used AI to understand the world, and the answer is that, well, it depends on the seed. That's kind of a lame conclusion, right? And you don't really want to uh, like develop drugs or medicine or something based on that view of the world. OK. So to sort of uh, build a little bit of math about how to actually reason about these things, we should talk about identifiability. So the, the root issue that we're facing here is that when we try to learn these latent representations, then there is no unique set of latent representations that sort of, uh, uh, yeah, that explain the data. Um, and that's sort of best, statistically we studied that in the context of identifiability. So to be precise, like to say, so we say that a statistical model is identifiable if when you change the parameters of the statistical model, you actually get a different density. And for a given density, there's only one set of parameters that describe that. Okay, so technically we can sort of say that there's a bijective mapping between the parameters of your model and the density it creates. Um, uh, and if this is not satisfied, imagine that a model is not identifiable. It simply means that there are multiple ways of parameterizing the same density. And if you then want to interpret the parameters, then you don't know which set of parameters to interpret because there are multiple uh, uh, parameters to choose from. So the bad issue here is that when it comes to generative models, practically all generative models are not identifiable. Uh, you have to look at very, very restricted models for them to be identifiable. And then sort of, uh, just to show you that, imagine that you have, let's say you found the global optimal latent representations and the associated decoder. You've successfully found it. Imagine that. Now what you can do is, you can simply change you can take a function g that maps from the latent space to the latent space, apply that to your uh, current best uh, latent uh, variables. That's your new representation. And then as a decoder, you simply start out by inverting that function g and then applying your before global uh, de optimal decoder. This is now an equally good by design. If you're spanning the exact same density, so in terms of model fit, it's equally good, but you can sort of arbitrarily deform your latent variables and you can just let your decoder compensate. Okay, so practice, like a practical example, I'll return to this in a bit, but you can sort of imagine these are your latent variables and you can sort of quite heavily distort them uh, without actually changing the quality of your model fit. This is quite terrible because this is, again, what we saw with the proteins that, you know, your training algorithm is just going to pick one of these at random, basically, at least arbitrarily. And then if you want to interpret the actual data from that, well, good luck. Um, okay, and, and the sort of the gist of the talk today is that we're going to solve this issue. Um, and the solution will rely on some differential geometry that I'll take you through, and then I'll sort of uh, try to take you through how to do that for actual uh, uh, models. Okay, so, and then you might say, okay, sure, that was a fine pitch, go away, I don't care. Um, at, at which point I would say, well, you really need to think about this. This is not some sort of minor thing we're talking about, this is essential. If you ever want to sort of uh, like open up these AI models and figure out what the hell they're doing, then you desperately need a form of identifiability. Otherwise, you'll just be guessing at arbitrariness. 
and you'll never be able to actually understand anything. So if you want to do interpretability of, the, of your favorite deep learning model or whatnot, you need identifiability. That's a prerequisite. But then you can say, I don't care. Well, there are other benefits to that. So here's an example of a sort of a, a, a data set where I fitted a Gaussian distribution. Um, and just by imposing identifiability constraints, but without adding parameters, I can turn this distribution into that distribution. No learning. There's no parameters involved, no estimation, just math. It takes you from this fit to that fit. That's pretty neat. I'll show you how to do that in a bit. Um, I showed you the biological data before. Uh, what we'll see is that, uh, that you can sort of find evolutionary trees in, uh, in, in this data simply by taking identifiability seriously, then, uh, then evolution pops out as a real signal. I'll show you that at the end of the talk. Um, and finally, we're also going to be able to control robots using this stuff because robot, roboticists care a lot about having their robot under control. They're deeply terrified of this arbitrary deep learning model just doing stuff with the robot they want actual knowledge and guarantees, and uh, this identifiability stuff will give them that. Um, okay, enough of the teaser. Let's actually you know, get into the, to, to, to the core. So we're dealing with uh, generative models. Let's just make it specific. Here's one generative model. The latent variable x, we'll assume it to be standard normal distributed, and then we'll have some decoder that maps from low dimensional latent space out into observation space. That's our generative model. There's a large collection of sort of state of the art models that basically uh, fit into this category. Um, and we've already seen this argument. Uh, we can sort of uh, take a function g, apply it to our latent variables uh, to deform that latent space. We can just invert that mapping when constructing a new, new decoder, and thus we have an identifiability issue. Now, the only thing is that we added this additional constraint when building our generative model that the latent variables follow a Gaussian distribution. So if our newly reparameterized model uh, is supposed to be equally optimal, then it needs to preserve the distribution of that prior. So, meaning that g of x also needs to be standard distributed, standard normal distributed. And then you might say, well, that's actually a pretty strict constraint. Perhaps that additional prior assumption like, takes away the identifiability issue. And then I just want to show you this plot I showed you before and like show you the associated equation. Um, so here's an example of a transformation of your latent space that preserves standard Gaussianity. You can see that it's a highly nonlinear transformation. What it does is that it rotates the latent variables with an angle, and that angle depends on the norm. Okay? So basically, depending on how far away you are from the origin of your latent space, I'm going to rotate you more or less. So you can think of this as being like that we have a bunch of concentric circles in the latent space. I'm going to rotate them more or less independently of each other. So you can see that you can quite heavily deform uh, your latent space. So yesterday, uh, Carl wanted to sort of go out for beer and to advertise that during his talk, he talked about relational learning, how you know to understand the flavor of beer, we sort of don't talk about the amount of hops or the ingredients that went into the beer. We rather say this beer is rather similar to that beer. Um, so, and that's, I, I share that view of the world. Um, so I quite often think that what we should care about is determining are two latent variables similar or not. So let's just try to look at distances, pairwise distances. So here I'm plotting like each dot the y code, the first coordinate of, uh, of each dot is a randomly chosen pair of latent variables where I compute the Euclidean distance between them, and then I do the same thing after the transformation. If the transformation didn't matter, then you would sort of see a straight identity line. 
But the fact that you see sort of a rather rich pattern suggests that you heavily distort, you can sort of heavily distort relationships between latent variables. Uh, and that is sort of what kills the relational signal that we might use to interpret uh, the phenomenon. Okay, so uh, these problems, they were sort of uh, first statistically uh, discussed about 100 years ago. Um, and the funny thing is that Gauss and Bernhard Riemann and people like that actually solved the uh, identifiability problem before the identifiability problem was discovered. So, uh, so we're kind of in this odd situation that the solution predates the problem, uh, but because it happened in parallel, like scientific communities, then somehow it got lost. Um, and that's sort of been my job, is to just point to that. And that's what I'm doing today. So uh, uh, Gauss was sort of pragmatic, and he liked simple solutions, and that's why we still care about them. Um, and the solution to all this identifiability stuff is remarkably simple. It's simply to say that whenever you look at distances between latent points, don't define that distance in terms of the Euclidean uh, distance in the latent space, but rather do it in the observation space, because then you're not sensitive to how you've parameterized uh, the latent variable space. And what does that mean? So, Let's say here's our observational space. Our data lies in here, there it is, and let's assume that it lies on some uh, nonlinear surface, a manifold. Um, and that's, that manifold is spanned by our decoder, and here's the associated latent space. Now, uh, as you may notice, I've drawn a curve in this latent space. Now, in order to define an appropriate and identifiable distance measure, I'm going to start out by simply asking how long is that curve? That will be the building block. Okay? And the, the, the thing that Gauss and colleagues uh, suggested is quite simple, is to define the length of this curve by simply decoding it, so mapping it out into observation space, and then measure the length of the curve out here, and say whatever number you get, that's the length of the latent curve, by definition. That, that's it. Once you do this, then we can sort of uh, crank the mathematical machinery and everything will work out. And I'll do a bit of that cranking today. Uh, I won't crank all the way through because of lack of time, but uh, uh, we'll get the basic stuff uh, up and running. So, um, yeah. Okay, so we're gonna measure curve lengths. Let's just quickly recall how to do that. Imagine you have a curve uh, in some Euclidean space. The way to measure the length of that curve is quite simple to discretize it. You cut it up into pieces, draw straight line segments between those pieces, measure the length of those straight lines. And then if you have enough like discretization points, you get a good approximation. So this is sort of an approximation to curve length. And obviously if you take like number of discretization points to infinity, well, you get like how mathematicians define the length of the curve. It's like this. And the good news is that this is a limit you can carry out like in, uh, in closed form. Um, and I'll sort of not take you through it, but you will, many of you will recognize this expression, which simply says that the length of the curve, you get that by integrating the speed of the curve, meaning the, uh, the norm of the velocity. Okay, so there we go. Now we have a notion of curve length. We can then plug that into what we had before. So we say we have a curve in latent space. Here's the associated decoded curve, f of c of t. Um, and we can simply define the length of this curve as the length of that curve. Okay? Easy peasy. And uh, next, in order to define a distance measure, we'll introduce a notion of shortest path. We'll say if you have two points in latent space, the shortest path is simply the connecting path that has the smallest length. It's a trivial definition. I'm not telling you how to compute it. I'm just saying it's kind of a trivial definition. And once you have that, then we can say, well, the actual distance between two points is the length of the shortest path. 
So now you see everything boils down to measuring curve lengths on this manifold that's spanned by the decoder in observation space. Um, and this, this is sort of by construction. It's invariant to however you choose to deform your latent space. If you choose to deform your latent space, then the way you actually, since we're measuring curve length, out here in observation space, then that doesn't really matter because the decoder will sort of compensate for whatever deformation you may have done in the latent space. Um, so this gives you sort of a uh, distance measure that's invariant to how you choose to parameterize the latent space. Um, and that, in turn, makes it identifiable. Okay, so let's uh, jump a little bit into the equations. This, this was our definition of the length of a curve. You see you have sort of a, a differentiation with respect to the parameterization of the curve. You can just uh, apply the chain rule. You get a Jacobian of the decoder and the velocity of, uh, of the curve in latent space. Um, that's just the chain rule. Now we take this norm that surrounds the expression and expand that. Uh, and out pops this expression. Um, nothing too surprising. And this in here, in that expression, you have this Jacobian transpose Jacobian. This, uh, you can see sort of by construction, it's, uh, it's going to be symmetric. It's going to be positive definite. This is a, a symmetric positive definite matrix that has the same dimension as the latent variable. So if you have a two-dimensional latent space, it's a two by two symmetric positive definite matrix. And this, this we call the metric, or the Riemannian metric. And you can see that it's sort of defined from the Jacobian of the decoder, so it sort of, it, it compensates for any distortion uh, made by the decoder locally. Um, so you can sort of think of this, uh, this expression here as like a Mahalanobis distance, if you're familiar with that, but only locally defined. Um, so, could, so basically, like the mental model we go for in differential geometry is to think of this matrix, we call it G, by the way, as forming a inner product that is locally defined. So usually we think of inner products as being something that covers uh, the entire space we're in. Now we just want to think of you have one inner product that uh, sort of describes a tiny patch of your latent space, and then in another patch of latent space you have another inner product structure. And with this, you can sort of define local norms. And uh, to sort of give an illustrative example, you can also define local angles. Um, so imagine you have two curves in latent space, and you want to, and that intersect. And you want to sort of ask, well, what's the angle of intersection? Well, you can compute, you can sort of look at the infinitesimal behavior of those curves. So by Taylor's theorem, that's just like the local linearization of those curves. Um, that gives us these velocity vectors. Um, and then you can compute simply the uh, angle in the standard way just using this uh, Riemannian, this local inner product. So th this is, I'm, I don't show you this because angles are particularly interesting, but just to sort of see how you operate, how you engage with these Riemannian metrics. That it's all about like local infinitesimal behavior. Okay, so this is perhaps the, uh, the more easily understood pictorial view of the world. You have your latent space and sort of in separate, like a, you can sort of imagine cutting it up in pieces and for each piece you have a different inner product structure. We shrink those pieces to become infinitesimally small and then the only additional requirement we add is that this inner product structure changes smoothly across space. And this is sort of fulfilled as long as your decoder is a smooth function. And this, basically this picture is the conceptual difference between a Euclidean part of the world and the Riemannian part. Yes? Uh, as long as your decoder is a smooth function, sounds like quite the restriction. So basically for this to be true, right, you need the Jacobian to exist. That means it needs to have one derivative. And then you need for this, like, uh, for this uh, metric, so the metric is Jacobian transpose Jacobian, 
that needs to change smoothly as well, meaning that needs to have a derivative. So you need like that the Jacobian is also differentiable, meaning that the decoder needs to have two derivatives. Um, so it's uh, like in the context of Gaussian processes, then like most GPs are very smooth. Um, so there we don't uh, see many issues in terms of neural networks then this can be a restriction because we often apply activation functions that are non-differentiable. I thought when you said smooth, you meant infinitely differentiable. Yes, and that's not a requirement. You need like two derivatives, okay. um, at least for most things. Okay, so just to sort of summarize this geometry part of the world, all we're doing is that we're saying distances or curve lengths should be defined by you decode the associated curve and measure the length out there. That, by construction, makes you invariant to how the latent space is parameterized. And once you have that, uh, like that naturally gives rise to this notion of a metric, uh, which is this positive definite matrix that locally measures uh, distances. Um, and uh, like the intuitive part we'll need about this metric is that if this matrix contains large values, it means that distances are large in those regions. Uh, and if it contains small values, then distances are small in that region. And then when you talk about geodesics, shortest paths, then they will tend to favor going through regions where distances are small, meaning distances where the metric has small values. That's sort of the pragmatic take on all of this. Okay, and we can use that to define all sorts of stuff like angles and volumes and probability measures and whatnot. But uh, jump in. Um, so you're talking about Riemannian metrics? Yes. For example, in relativity theory, you have like the general case where you um, have a non positive definite yes. Riemannian metric. Can you do also the same approach in these puzzles? So that can happen if you sort of imagine that the data actually lies on a two dimensional manifold and I model and I like give my model, tell it that it should have a three-dimensional latent space. Then you will see degeneracies where like the metric will, on, will not be positive definite but only be semi-definite. Um, and I mean, it's pra practically speaking, that never happens because it's always the opposite that we always sort of end up using too small a latent space because we often choose the latent space out of like other considerations than how the, uh, the real world behaves, like computational considerations, or you want to be able to make a plot or something. Um, but there is, like, there's a whole field of, uh, of, su of studying pseudo Riemannian metrics, uh, in part because of the need in physics. So you're still sort of on fairly safe ground. Most of what I tell you will still hold, even in that setting. But cool, and thanks for jumping in. Like, uh, it's much appreciated. Okay, so that's sort of the, the brief primer on geometry I'm going to give you. Now, um, let me see if I can remember my slides, I think. Yeah, now let's uh, jump over and see if this stuff actually works. So let's, uh, let's use it. We have now built a theory of how to, you know, do relative uh, things in latent spaces of uh, generative models. Let's apply it. Let's go to science. But, you know, before we do science, let's just do a quick sanity check. Let's just, you know, come up with a toy example and test that everything works as expected, just to make sure. So this is the simplest problem I could come up with, a circle. So I literally just generated points on a circle put that circle in high dimen in a thousand dimensional uh, Euclidean space, deformed it a bit, and added some Gaussian noise. That's my data set. And now I want to sort of find the associated latent representation and study the geometry of that. It's just to verify that we're recovering this circular structure that was really driving the data that I uh, created. All right, so here's my latent representation. So far, so good. Like clearly, there's a circle in the latent representation. Now we just need the geometry to sort of reflect that. 
and I can, uh, like, uh, I have, let's say I've recovered my uh, decoder, and I, I promise you I did a really good job of actually fitting this model. So the decoder is superbly fit. Um, and I'll show you the metric, and I'll show you that in this form as this color in the background that shows you the determinant of the metric. So the metric is this two by two positive definite matrix that changes throughout the latent space, and I'm showing you the determinant as the background color. It's mostly for pretty colors, but it's also sometimes informative. Um, and then, now let's compute some geodesics, geodesics being shortest paths. So they tell us sort of how does the manifold work. And here they are. Like, so what you see is that you have points lying on a circular structure, and to, from, to get from one point to another, you just follow a straight line. That's what geometry more or less tells you. And this, this is really depressing, right? You have, a, you have a very clear structure in your data. And we're like, my hope would be that these geodesics could somehow help us reveal that pattern, the circular pattern. I mean, it totally doesn't. It's a disaster. So why is that happening? So we'll do this in two steps. First, we'll sort of just look at the intuition of why this is happening, and then we'll go a little bit more in depth about analyzing it. Sorry. Yeah. What have you actually drawn here? The shortest paths between all pairs of points, or yeah. just the nearest? No, so I, I just I, I sample random point pairs and compute uh, like the shortest path, and then I plot it. They look almost straight. Yes. Because the manifold, like the actual underlying physical phenomenon, is a circle. So what do you want to see? Only lines? I would prefer to see cir circular arcs. Okay. Because that would sort of, uh, following the data, because that would mean that the geometry that we've sort of had recovered would match the geometry of the circle, which was sort of the true generating uh, phenomenon. And like, if I saw that, then I would be able to say, hey, now I can understand circular periodic phenomena that appear in nature. Um, here, I clearly cannot. Like, uh, I simply that, you know, that what, what you see here is that uh, this model views the circle as being something where you just walk across the hole. Um, thanks for jumping in. So, so if, if you define the geodesic, if you compute that on a nearest neighbor graph, then yes, then you will sort of walk along here. The problem is that's not actually the geodesic. Like that's a, but it's not even an approximation. It's, it's unrelated to, uh, to the actual uh, geodesic. So the geodesic is simply the curve that minimizes the length under this uh, uh, under this metric. Because you're working principally on the manifold? Yes. Um, and uh, so, yes, you can definitely plug in things and say, like, hey, this is my definition of the shortest path. But it wouldn't sort of come with an actual mathematical uh, model. Can't you simply change the metric, like with density? Like mm -hmm. if it's more dense, you make the metric yes. bigger or larger? So yes. Yes, you definitely can. So what I'm trying here is to say, we have a model. I want like, that model to determine the geometry. I want to basically, and this is a terrible thing to do at a machine learning conference or a machine learning meeting, is that I want to say I don't want to learn anything. I simply want to derive. Um, so, but just to give you like the actual pictorial view of what's happening here is that, uh, I mean, what we're really learning with these things is sort of this surface that interpolates the data. And the geodesics we're seeing 
are just artifacts of the fact that we're filling, that our model fills in this hole. It has no notion of a hole in it. It's simply oblivious to the idea that there is a hole. It's just trying to interpolate the data. And at that point, it's completely natural to say, yes, that's just cut across the hole, because that's what the model is actually telling you to do. So it's like, it's doing the right thing. These are the, the correct geodesics. It's that the model is not informing us about what we need to know. And that's really frustrating. But let's, uh, let, let's dig into the equations to see this in more detail, because it's actually enlightening to analyze this failure. So in order to do that, I'm going to define some limits. And these limits, I call them away and near. And what they are are quite simply asking, well, what happens to some quantity? And that could be any quantity. What happens to that quantity when you, become, when you sort of move infinitesimally close to your training data? And what happens when you move infinitely far away from your training data? I want to emphasize that these limits are not always defined. It's not always possible to actually calculate these limits. But for models uh, that, for the most simple Gaussian process models, you can actually compute these. And we'll show you that in a bit. But what we're trying to quantify by these limits is simply what is the behavior of something when you're close to the training data and when you're far away from the training data. And the reason why we're interested in this is because, well, before we had this hole in the middle. So there, we didn't have any training data. And clearly, that seemed to cause issues. So that's why it seems natural to study what happens with our model when we move away from the data. So we have these limits for that. Um, and then that's just, I mean, this is a Gaussian process school. So let's look at the uh, posterior mean uh, predictive of a Gaussian process and use that as our decode. That seems like a natural uh, decoder to use. Um, I've written it up here. You've seen this equation before. And then I'm saying, like, OK, let's consider the case of that there's no noise in the data. And we have as much data as we possibly could ever want. Let's just like, look at that case. Just verify that things are OK in that case. Um, so here I've uh, computed the Jacobian of this function and multiplied that by itself. That's what appears in this horrible equation. Don't stare at it long. It doesn't really tell you anything. Um, I just put it on there to have equations. Um, and so, OK, so let's assume that you have a sufficiently well-behaved uh, covariance function, a universal kernel. Uh, and let's assume that we have infinite noise-free data. Well, in that case, it's sort of an established result that this uh, thing will actually converge to the true uh, underlying function that generated the data. Um, once we have that, that uh, sort of uh, approaches the, uh, the real function where we have training data, and also implies that the metric that you get here actually approaches the true metric of the, gener uh, of the, of the true generating system. That's good news. This is great. That means if we have enough data, then at the places where we have data, we will learn the correct geometry. That's good. This is a sign that we're not doing something absurd. OK, now let's look at how the models behave when you then move away from data, when you're, in, when you're extrapolating. And this will depend on your choice of covariance function. So let's just do the simplest one. Uh, the RBF, or the Gaussian kernel, or the squared exponential, or the exponentiated quadratic, or whatever people call it, this thing, this covariance function. Um, and then let's just uh, see what that does. Well, this, with this covariance function, it's sort of uh, well known that the associated posterior will extrapolate to zero. Once you move sufficiently far away from data, under this covariance function, your prediction will be, your mean prediction will be zero, uh, at least for the uh, prior with zero mean. So that means it extrapolates to a constant. That constant has Jacobian zero. So when you're far away from the data, you get that the Jacobian of the decoder is zero, meaning that the metric is zero. So far away from the data, the metric is just the matrix containing zeros. 
Okay, so what does that imply when you compute geodesics, short paths? Well, they start looking like this. It's, I, I think this is a beautiful picture. I absolutely love it. It's, it's a it describes a horrible favor, but a failure, but it's a beautiful picture. So these dark brown regions out here, that they are sort of in the far away regime. The metric is almost zero out here. So what that means is that if you have a curve that moves out here and then moves from here to here, the length of that curve segment is zero because you're integrating it along a metric that has zero value. So basically travel time from here to here is zero. So we've sort of introduced a view of the world where we basically have like a teleport out here in the dark brown region. You walk out in the dark brown region, you can jump in anywhere else you want in the dark brown region, and that's what geodesics have discovered. They just sort of move out here, they jump randomly for free, and then they move back in. Um, okay, that's pretty terrible. And, and we're not gonna be able to use this to actually discover how nature works, right? Um, so, but okay. So clearly this depends on the extrapolation behavior. So let's just redo the experiment with a perhaps slightly more extrapolate, uh, sensible extrapolation scheme. So I'm just gonna add a linear kernel to my choice of covariance function. That means we're gonna extrapolate according to a linear function. That's at least slightly more sensible. Um, and you can do the same calculations. You, you do something far away, and what you see is that far away from the data, you're now gonna get like a scaled Euclidean metric, which is reasonable. You're extrapolating to a linear manifold. It's not unreasonable that you get a Euclidean metric from that. Um, and this, this is the picture I showed you before, where I sort of, uh, the initial geodesics I showed you. Um, and that, that sort of explains what happens, why it cuts across here, because we're basically filling out the hole with the linear piece, and though, like, linear paths are the shortest possible paths you could ever find. So, uh, so it's natural that geodesics just cut across. So what you see is that basically the behavior of these shortest paths crucially depend on how you choose to extrapolate. Um, so now we might say, okay, well, let's just extrapolate the right way. You know, let's define an extrapolation scheme that makes geometry work. Let's go for that. What does that imply? Well, if we want geodesics to sort of stay relatively close to the data, it means we need to extrapolate with something that causes the metric to become large far away from data. That means the Jacobian has to become large far away from data. That means the extrapolating behavior of our function has to be wiggly, it needs to have large derivatives. And this this is the exact opposite of what you want in machine learning, where we always design our regularization, our priors, to impose smoothness, to impose that things don't change too much, because with weekly priors, you can't learn anything. Um, so we're basically, if we sort of take this mentality, then we have to choose between actually being able to learn the decoder and having a sensible geometry associated with the decoder. We can't have both, it's either or. And that's like, that's not a healthy place to be. Someone said something? Oh, ah, yeah. that. If you have like a crazy big function, yeah. or something like that, does that also reduce, so you just use like, you could imagine you have a big region around your data where you can have Right, so if you sort of have like your prior mean, let's say you've designed your prior mean such that it's like very smooth and well behaved where you have data and then does crazy stuff where you don't have data, then that would fix this issue. The only issue is that now your prior needs to be aware of the data. And uh, like, I, so I, I'm like, I'm not, I'm not a real Bayesian, I just pretend from time to time. So I, I could probably be okay with that, but I know people in this room who would be very upset about the idea of letting the prior being determined by the data. Um, and uh, yeah, I won't point to anybody. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is the situation. Geometry works in theory, 
in practice, it totally sucks. And the only way we can make it work is by preventing machine learning from working. Yay. Um, So you, you could potentially do something like that. Um, the only issue is I don't know what that would mean. Like I, I, I can sort of see that I could, de I, I, could define, I could define it as such. Um, but if I did it, then I wouldn't sort of be able to say, well, now the associated distances are actually invariant to how I parameterized my latent space, so I would have to give up on the notion of identifiability. But you could def like you can yeah. definitely design metrics that sort of force geodesics to move close to the data, but it's harder to ensure like a guarantee that you're then uh, yeah. uh, identifiable. So we're sort of trying to do both, and perhaps that's just asking too much. Or <laughs> so there's always. Uh, uh, a solution, as I said, like I have great graphic skills, right? Um, um, so, okay, so there is this, <laughs> um, we have seen, like GPs are great for multiple reasons, but one of them is that they tend to assign high predictive uncertainty whenever they are extrapolating. So like the predictive variance of a GP tends to be large when you move away from data. Um, and what we're seeing is that apparently, like that behavior of what happens when you move away from data influences the geometry. So perhaps there's some sort of signal in this uncertainty that we can use to make the geometry well behaved. One could hope. Um, and also, like we're at GPSS, <laughs> I kind of have to do this, right? Um, okay. So just to. Uh, uh, get us all on the same page, right? So in order to, so let's now assume that we're using the full Gaussian process as our decoder. We now have a stochastic decoder. Okay, so we're interested in the metric. The metric is the Jacobian of the decoder times the Jacobian of the decoder. So the Jacobian of a Gaussian process, what's that? Well, we're in luck. Gaussian distributions are closed under linear operators, meaning that if you apply a linear operator to a Gaussian variable, you get another Gaussian variable. And one such operator could be differentiation. So what that means, what I'm really saying, is that the derivative of a Gaussian process is another Gaussian process. And you can write up the covariance of the derivative process quite easily, simply by differentiating the covariance function. Um, so that's really neat, because what that means is that the Jacobian of the decoder follows a Gaussian process, and if I make the common assumption in uh, generative models that conditioned on the latent variables, the output dimensions, that, that they are independent, this is like the driving assumption of practically all models, uh, then you get the following Jacobian. Great, we actually have an expression for the Jacobian. It's a GP as well. And then we're going to make a simplifying assumption, which is that I'm going to assume that the covariance is the same across all output dimensions. That just means I'm using the same covariance function when predicting all output dimensions. This reduces computations a lot. Um, if you do that, well, we call the resulting model the Gaussian process latent variable model. Um, I don't think Neil is here, so I can safely say that it's the most beautiful model available in machine learning in my view of the world. Um, it's a, I think it's an absolutely marvelous model, but it has to some extent been forgotten in the past decade or so, which is a shame. Um, okay, so that's our model. But now we're, sort of, we're, we're back to being in trouble, because now I can take this matrix, it's a random variable, I can transpose it and multiply it by itself, that gives me the metric. Now that metric is also a random variable now, because I'm just multiplying random matrices. Uh, and all this geometry stuff I showed you, well, that assumes that the metric is a deterministic quantity, not a random variable. 
So I can't apply any of the geometry I just like, spent the last hour preaching to you. That's pretty sad. Um, so let's lower our expectations a little bit and see, well, what can we do? Um, so the metric, Jacobian transpose Jacobian, like you can, this follows a non-central Wishart distribution. If you haven't heard about that ever, fine. It doesn't matter. We're not going to use that for anything. But it's to say that it actually has a distribution that's reasonably well studied. Um, people often use this for modeling like precision matrices. Um, and uh, what's neat is that we know something about this distribution. We know what, at least what the mean and the variance are. Um, of, uh, so we can sort of ask, well, what, is, what does the metric actually behave like in terms of its moments? And the, the expectation, the mean metric, is actually quite simple. Um, so you see that it contains two parts. The first term is the expectation of the Jacobian transpose times itself. Okay, so that, like, uh, if you if you recall the geometry we looked at before, which just looked at the mean function of the GP, the expectation of the Jacobian is the Jacobian of that mean because the expectation and differentiation for mu's. So the first term here is the metric we had before, one we've already worked with, and then we have a second term which sort of scales the metric by the covariance of the Jacobian. Okay? That's something. I don't know what to say about that, but it's something. Um, and then the, what's neat is that we know that these non-central Wishart distributions, they tend to concentrate in high dimensions. So what that means is that if the data dimension is large, the variance of that distribution will start shrinking. It's like a, it's a central limit theorem uh, type of thing. Um, and uh, that's really positive. That's a really good sign. Because what that says is that if we have high dimensional data, and we almost always do when looking at these generative models because we're trying to reduce data dimension. So it's sort of natural that we're in high dimensional data regimes. In these cases, the distribution of the metric is going to concentrate around the mean. And that suggests that, okay, perhaps we can sort of uh, loosen our requirements of looking at the stochastic metric and just take the expectation of the metric, because this we can apply all the differential geometry stuff to. So let's try to do that. Um, so you remember this picture. This was with the uh, Gaussian kernel. Um, where we just looked at the mean. If you repeat the exact same experiment, but with the expected metric, then geodesics start to look like this. So it's sort of a, and I didn't cheat here. This isn't some like a hand-tuned parameter case setting. This is what naturally pops out. Um, you see that geodesics, short paths, immediately start to follow circular arcs or near circular arcs. Um, and you also see that basically the metric becomes large outside the data support. And that's because of this added covariance term that we had, uh, this additional term. This will be large outside the data support because the Jacobian is uncertain when we're not uh, close to the data. And that will then force geodesics to, uh, to move closer to the data. So this, like, uh, at this point, I'm like reasonably happy. Now I have something that's almost giving me the identifiability stuff I'm looking for. I have to plug in, plug in sort of an expectation that I'm not too fond of, but beyond that, like this is identifiable and actually captures the structure of, uh, of what we're dealing with. So uh, I did this analysis with what happens when you're near the data and what's far away from the data, and we can revisit that analysis uh, uh, for the expected metric. And what you see is that when you're near the data, the covariance of the Jacobian shrinks to zero. That's unsurprising. We're assuming that we don't have data noise. 
So the function becomes perfectly estimated. We get the right metric. It matches the metric that we had for the deterministic case, and we're all happy. Far away from the data, the covariance actually doesn't diminish. It becomes something. Like this is basically a scalar times the identity matrix. Um, and the metric far away from the data will basically reduce to that. Um, so what that tells you is that, okay, when you're far away from the data, there's going to be a cost. A geodesic can, cannot move freely. We cannot have these teleports anymore. This is not a guarantee, though. It's not a guarantee that magically geometry works, but it's hope. Like, there is simple, like, uh, there is just a tiny bit of hope that now geometry will actually be well behaved. No guarantees, but hope. And that's something. Um, so, like, uh, the, the summary before we move to actually applying this stuff and doing fun applications is basically that, okay, geometry works in theory. It totally sucks in practice unless you capture uncertainty in your model, unless you care about distributions over functions, unless you attend GPSS. Um, so basically, with uncertainty, there is hope. And I think that that, to me, is like, I think that's a beautiful life lesson in general. Like, if you don't have uncertainty, then forget it. You have no chance. But if you have uncertainty, then there's hope that something will happen. Um, okay. So, this is the emotional picture. We're now on top of the world. We're ready to move on to, uh, and I hate to do this, right? I mean, <laughs> it's like, I, I, uh, the thing is, what happens when you actually start applying this stuff is that you have to fit this Gaussian process latent variable model to your data. That turns out to be absurdly hard. It is like the worst optimization problem on the planet. It's nothing but local minima, and they are everywhere, and like, gah. Uh, so there, there's this whole literature on how to initialize this correctly, and what are sort of the, the tricks of the trade, and there are like a couple of labs in this world that can fit such a model. Carl Hendrick is one of the few people who is uh, who's skilled at that. Uh, but uh, like in general, like, I, I love this model, but it's completely unfittable. Um, so, uh, as uh, Carl Henrik said in the beginning here, like I've been doing this for a long time, like, uh, and uh, my hair is getting grayer in the process. So basically, I started all this stuff in around 2012, which was, was also the year of the AlexNet paper which is sort of what kicked off the whole revitalization of neural networks and, uh, and sort of started this AI bubble that we're in, burst any day. Um, and uh, yeah, like I had to survive, you know, I, I have to uh, make a living. So I, I couldn't afford to fiddle around with my non-trainable GPLVMs. <laughs> That's a, it's, it's a terrible truth. Um, so uh, what I'll show you first is like a bunch of applications we've been doing over the years where we follow a generative model of this type. This is uh, like this function and that function are now neural networks, but you see it's like, if you squint a bit, it kind of looks like a GP, but it isn't. It's not. Uh, but if you squint a bit, it kind of looks like it. But squint, right? And, and in all honesty, like, I think this is terrible. It's, it's, it's really, really ugly, and the amount of hacks we have to introduce in these neural network models to ensure basic things such as uncertainty is high when you're far away from data, uh, it's, like, it's terrible. Like it, you have to do so many hacks to make these models work, and with GPs, you get all this stuff for free with no need for hacks. Um, so I would really like to do all this stuff with GPs. Um, but what I'll show you first is like neural network applications because we're further ahead there. But it's close to being a GP. Close. OK, so back in the days, you had to do MNIST all the time. Thankfully, we're 
beyond that. This is like the latent space uh, where we've uh, like modeled zero and one digits from MNIST. Here are some geodesics and some straight lines, and I can show you what they decode to, and I don't know what that means. Like, I can show you some plots, but I honestly don't know what to take away from the plots. Um, but what I can do is I can compute distances. So I can sort of simply take all my data, look at all possible pairs of latent variables, compute the Euclidean distance between them, and compute the associated geodesic distance. This is identifiable. This is not. This is informative. This is not. You see a very clear structure in, this, uh, in these distances that very clearly reveal the underlying uh, clustering of the data that's completely lost in the Euclidean world. And you immediately see this if you start to do any form of actual clustering according to these distances uh, where uh, you get a much stronger signal. So okay, this is good right? because all this geometry stuff, it gives us some like mathematical niceties, but it actually also pays off in terms of putting numbers in bold. And that's apparently a really big deal in machine learning. Um, so I teased this uh, plot earlier on. This is uh, one of my favorite plots in the world. I really like it. So this, as I mentioned before, each dot is the latent representation of one protein. So this is an entire protein family. Um, and what we can do is, so we can start computing shortest paths, geodesics. They look like this. You know, we show this to biologists, and they are way better at reading plots than I am. I largely see a bunch of squiggly lines on top of some points. And uh, when we show this to biologists, they say, ooh, look, it's branching out. It clearly has like a tree-like structure. If it's tree-like, then it must be evolution, because evolution follows a tree structure. Whenever there's a, like a mutation is the word, then you branch off in a different direction. So this is like, that's the gut reaction that a biologist gets from looking at this plot. For me, it's just weekly lines. Um, and, and then we say, okay, well, let's see. Is there a relationship between these curves and the underlying evolution? So um, here I've sort of... Uh, for this data, we can actually compute the underlying evolutionary tree, or approximate it at least. Um, and uh, if you squint a bit, we've sort of superimposed it on here, and you see, if you squint a bit, it looks a little bit like the curves, but I don't know. Uh, is it really, is it not? But what you can do is that you can actually measure uh, what's called phylogenetic distances, which are evolutionary time differences. They just basically measure what sort of the evolutionary time that went between two, uh, uh, between two species. And uh, this, this turns out to correlate significantly stronger with geodesic distances than the Euclidean distances do. So basically, when it comes to Euclidean distances, you have nearly no signal in terms of recovering the underlying evolutionary structure. Whereas with the, with the geodesic distance, you actually start to picking up, pick up on a signal. It's far from perfect, but you should never expect perfection with this type of data. This is uh, terrible data. Um, so this, this is really exciting, right? Because all of this is purely about how you choose to interpret the models that you have trained. There's no additional machine learning on top here. It's purely how do you look at it. And if you look at it with your geometric glasses on, you start to see a signal that was otherwise lost. And that signal is the driving mechanism of the data. That I find really amazing. Um, OK. So uh, but let's say you're a machine learner and you don't care about science. You just want to like, build better predictive models or whatnot. Want to generate more pretty pictures with your generative model or something. Does this then help you? And the answer is yes. So, we started out by having a prior over the latent variables that was just a standard Gaussian. And in essence, that standard Gaussian, like that distribution, just boils down to measuring the squared Euclidean distance to the mean of the distribution. And I think 
by now you have, will have picked up on this idea that I really don't like Euclidean distances in these latent spaces. I really object to them, right? So perhaps we should like try to plug in like a geodesic distance here. Can we somehow do that? And it turns out that there's a neat way of doing it. Um, let's just skip that part. Um, and that neat way is Brownian motion. So Brownian motion is sort of a, uh, you may know it, if you take small random Gaussian steps and sort of ask where do you end up after a sufficiently long time, that the endpoint, uh, like the path, you would say is a Brownian motion, the endpoint follows a Gaussian distribution. Like in Riemannian spaces, you can follow the same procedure where you take small infinitesimal steps at random and ask where you end up. Uh, and that would give you a generalization of Gaussian distribution. And here's like a simple sampling scheme of how you may sample from that. Just boil it boils down to using the metric as sort of as a local precision matrix that shapes in which directions do you sample. Um, you can sort of try to animate that here. Uh, so this is the latent space where we still walk according to, randomly according to the metric. You can think of that as you take an infinitesimal step of a fixed size uh, or from a fixed size Gaussian that works tangentially to the uh, manifold that's spanned by the, uh, by the decoder. And so that if you ask, well, where do you end up after a fixed amount of time, that, um, that distribution doesn't have a closed form expression, but it has an approximate density that's of this form. And you may recognize that this here is basically the expression we had before, but now with the geodesic distance plugged in. This is a first order parametric expansion, so it's a pretty crude expansion. But nonetheless, like if I sort of replace my Euclidean Gaussian distribution with this thing, then I get that. So I would argue that this is a better fit than that. And what's interesting here is that I didn't have to introduce parameters to do this. Like, this isn't some normalizing flow with a million parameters or anything. This has a mean and a standard deviation. That's it. Like, there's, everything else is just deduced information coming from the decoder. So it's just leveraging the fact that we have access to this metric that all of a sudden gives you high adaptability at no parameter cost. Um, okay, and you can put numbers in bold if you're so inclined, and yay, they're bold, who cares? Um, what's more exciting is, of course, robots. We're building AI to let robots take over the world and kill humanity, so let's work on that. Um, and uh, here's like a simple thing. So people in robotics, they tend to care a lot about the fact that they know what the robots are doing. They don't want them to do arbitrary stuff because these are powerful machines that could like punch your head off uh, by accident. That they really don't want that to happen. So what we can do is, we can do this thing called learning from demonstrations, which boils down to a very simple idea. You turn off the engine in the, in the robot and then you just move around the arm as you want the robot to move. In the process, you collect data of like how the individual joints were positioned over time. Uh, that gives you training data. Now we can fit a generative model to that. That gives you a latent parameterization. Now you sort of ask to use geodesics, shortest paths, as sort of the motion primitives you use for your planning algorithm. Um, and if you do that, you get a robot that does what you want. And uh, this is sort of the thing running in real time. Uh, so like with a few computational tricks, you can compute these geodesics at about 100 hertz. Um, and uh, that's sort of enough to run the robot in real time on this. So here's an example where the latent space is three-dimensional. So this is the latent space we're looking at. These red donuts are regions where the uh, uncertainty of the model is small. Um, so basically inside these red donuts lie the latent variables of, of the model and then we can sort of use that to control the, uh, the robot. It will then move along these geodesics, meaning it will move inside these uh, now yellow oddly shaped things. Um, and now it's just running a loop. Um, okay, 
So just like a teeny tiny bit of math. I'm almost done. Um, but the decide, like the, the starting criteria when we started developing all of this was to say, okay, let's put, let's take a, the output space, like the space in which our data lives and measure curve length out there. And we'll measure that as Euclidean curve length. And now you may ask, well, why Euclidean? Why not something else? And uh, given that all we're doing is infinitesimal, it's quite easy to just plug in any old Riemannian metric uh, in the output space if you're so inclined. I don't know how, I, can, I can't in general tell you how to get such a metric, but sometimes you can. I'll show you an example uh, of that. So, you know, here's the robot moving around, and one of the design criteria is that if I step into the like, workspace of the robot, then I don't want to be punched in the face. That's like, uh, I think that's a good design principle. Um, so we want that robot to avoid obstacles. So what we can do is, if we know where obstacles are at, then we can simply change the metric in the output space to make it expensive, computationally expensive, to walk near an obstacle, for a geodesic to go near an obstacle. Um, so this is an example of such. Uh, and all it means is that you sort of penalize shortest paths if they walk too close to obstacles. And again, you can do that in real time and uh, uh, use that to control robots. So we're not, this is the three-dimensional case, we're not currently allowed to actually test this with humans walking around the robot, for safety reasons and stuff like that. We're, so, so right now, uh, this is an actual robot running and it's avoiding an a virtual object. That's like the blue ball that has down there. Um, and uh, hopefully, like before New Year, I hope that we sort of have uh, permission to have a PhD student running around with the robot. Not like a professor, but just a PhD student. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. But I, I can't like help myself but to offer a glimpse of hope for the Gaussian processes. So I really, I, I have felt like, I, I felt like I've inter intellectually been needing a shower in the last decade from working with these neural network models. The amount of hacks that you have to inject to actually make them work is overwhelming. There's so much uh, uh, hackery that's needed. And the Gaussian process models are much to be preferred. The geometry works out nicer and, uh, and you know, we really want this stuff. So, uh, yeah. So let me sketch out how you fit a Gaussian process latent variable model. Basically, a Gaussian process latent variable model is a regression problem. You have your decoder, you're trying to estimate that. You have your outputs. The only issue is that you don't know the inputs. So you're solving a regression problem where you don't have input data, you only have output data. That's kind of a crappy situation to be in, and Carl Hendricks sort of also hinted that uh, you kind of need to inject some assumptions for this to work out. Um, and uh, there are various assumptions you can inject, but at the end of the day, what you're really trying to do is you're trying to find the optimal inputs that could have generated the outputs while you're also f trying to find the function itself. And this is in itself like hard. And that makes learning these GPLDMs hard. Finding the latent variables is difficult. Finding the parameters of the covariance function is difficult. Um, and to make matters worse, we want to scale these things. So as Vincent talked about this morning, like we inject these inducing point uh, approximations, these sparse Gaussian processes. Uh, in order to scale these Gaussian process latent variable models to large data sets. And so what is then happening is that you're in your latent space, you're trying to find some uh, latent variables. At the same time, you're trying to find some inducing variables which also lie in latent space. And they determine the quality of the approximation that you use for fitting the GP. And this is difficult. And sort of imagine just throwing your standard optimizer into it, it it's genuinely hard. Uh, 
And like the GPLVM is hard on its own, but with the added inducing points, it becomes increasingly difficult. So, uh, so here's sort of a, a, a glimpse of hope that, that has made me optimistic. Um, so this, the, these are the latent representations on the entire MNIST trained with a, a sort of inducing point approximating GP, and this is for fashion MNIST. And it's, it's a bit of a mess, right? I mean, it's a, you see a bit of structure, especially down here, but it's not overwhelming. These are the corresponding ones for uh, uh, a variational autoencoder, and you see much more structure. Um, and uh, so this is another uh, Gaussian process latent variable model, but fitted without using inducing points. Um, and there you see quite a bit more structure. And that makes me like, uh, optimistic. And, uh, uh, and indeed, this, uh, what, what we see, I haven't told you how to actually fit this one. Um, but what we see is that you can actually improve on the standard measures that people use for evaluating unsupervised representation learning. You can actually, the, the GPLVM can actually beat things like variational autoencoders in terms of these representation learning metrics, even for reasonably large data sets. They are simple data sets, but nonetheless, nonetheless, this is sort of a positive signal. Um, and so this, uh, this is uh, some work that uh, my postdoc Pablo and my now former PhD student Celia did. And Celia spent basically her entire PhD trying to compute geodesics in Gaussian process leak variable models. She had a tough time. Uh, she, like, she experienced a lot of frustrations. I think that's fair to say. Um, and around the end of her PhD, we sort of worked out this better learning mechanism. Uh, and while she was writing her thesis, I was like, oh, have you actually tried computing geodesics under these models? And she just looked at me and clearly wanted to punch me in the face because I was clearly uh, asking her to do a lot of work right around her thesis deadline. Um, but she's, she's a very kind person, so she didn't punch me in the face. She instead said, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> and, and the crazy part is that, like, it just worked. So this is just a straight line for reference, and this is sort of a geodesic computed in fashion MNIST. And just like it was, like uh, it took her 15 minutes. She came back like immediately after. And was like, oh, it works. Uh, and this was like after spending three years struggling uh, to compute anything. So there, there's a hope. And now you may say, well, how on earth did you then compute these uh, GPLDMs? What was the trick? And I'm out of time. <laughs> so, sorry, I basically can't tell you, but uh, uh, the basic idea is to go back to like, the very, very first approximations people did for making sparse Gaussian processes, which is what was called active sets. So, it's the exact same thing as the inducing points Vincent, Vincent talked about, except inducing points are freely moving variables that you can optimize whereas in active sets, they are forced to be part of your training data. And people gave up on this idea of active sets because, well, finding the correct training data to use is a combinatorially hard optimization problem, and it's just a nightmare. Um, and what we sort of uh, stumbled on is, was sort of a justification for just randomly sampling your active set. So just pick a random active set, do that to compute like one mini batch gradient, then pick a new random active set and repeat. Um, and this process, you can sort of uh, argue that it gives you like a biased estimate of the marginal likelihood and uh, that's all fine and dandy, uh, but the neat thing is that it's way more reliable for unsupervised learning. For supervised learning, it doesn't buy you that much, but uh, for unsupervised learning, it makes like a massive difference because you avoid this issue of optimizing latent, latent variables alongside inducing variables. Um, but uh, ask me if you're, if you're sort of curious about this. I am flying out today, so I'm only around for the next couple of hours, but uh, 
ping me if you want to talk. Okay, on that note, I'm going to end up. Um, so the basic summary is that, okay, geometry is nice. It solves the identifiability problem in theory. In practice, it doesn't work unless you're being this, treating the decoder function distributionally. You need to work with the full posterior, not just its mode. Uh, but with that uncertainty, there is hope. Um, now, the only issue is that getting access to uncertainty is hard. GPs solve a big part of the math question, um, and uh, that's super nice. So there's somehow hope for this direction. And, uh, and you can sort of, if you want to dig more into it, you can sort of, uh, I have a bunch of material collected at Weekend with Bernie on my website. Um, and uh, I think you have to be about the age of 40 or something to get the movie reference joke that's hidden in there. But it's, it's aimed to be tutorial material on the work of Bernhard Riemann. Um, and you can sort of find lecture notes and tutorials and uh, software if you want to actually implement this. Then it's surprisingly easy doing so. Um, and references and stuff like that. And speaking of references, here's a bunch of papers, some from my group, some from others. I think blah, 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 there was a paper by Carl Henrik um, and, uh, and so forth. And on that note, I'll simply say thanks for having me.